Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's video. We're so glad that you could join us online tonight as we look at God's Word together. My name is Pastor Tyler. I'm the student ministries pastor here and also your media pastor. I just want to say it's an honor to be leading uh, tonight's Bible study with you. It was so awesome getting to meet in person for the first time this Sunday. Um, in almost eight or ten weeks, it feels like a lifetime, but if you missed us on Sunday in that historical Sunday back, we have that sermon posted online. Uh, it's a very encouraging word. It's a great charge and a challenge for us in the kingdom as we begin to return to church in person. So check that message out if you have not. We're excited to worship with you again this Sunday uh, as we come back. Before we go any further tonight, um, if you would, why don't you go ahead and give us a like, a thumbs up. Um, go ahead and drop a comment below, just letting us know that you're watching. And before the end of this video, if you would hit that share button, we would really appreciate that. Um, we ask that you share not only to increase our online presence, but also um, it could be an encouraging word to somebody else tonight uh, or this week. You just never know. So if you would, please like, comment, and share. Uh, thank you in advance for doing that. Well, let's go ahead and get into tonight's study. We have been in a teaching series called Untold Stories. And these are people of the Bible that you wouldn't necessarily put at the top of your list. Or maybe you don't really remember learning about as a kid in Sunday school. Usually they have some weird or odd sounding names. Or uh, they aren't mentioned for very long in their uh, passage in the Bible. Or maybe we've traditionally seen them in a negative light and we look at them through a different perspective. And that's what we've been doing throughout this uh, series. Recently, we've been pulling names from a passage in Hebrews chapter 11 known as the Hall of Faith. Where it describes great leaders of faith throughout the Bible. We recognize and nod at names that we see such as Abraham or Moses uh, those are names that we recognize and we're, you know, very familiar with. But then we see other names on this list like Rahab and Barak, and we kind of do a double take. So with any name on this list in the Hall of Faith, whether we know it or not, we should ask this question right here. Why? Why are they on the list? When I see a name like Gideon on the list, even though I know who he is now, when I was younger, when I saw a name like Gideon, I would wonder and try to remember what put Gideon in the hall of faith. What did someone do to earn a spot on this list? You know, it's very similar when you look at lists uh, from all the major sports and their halls of fame. Uh, I bet if you looked at the NBA or NFL's hall of fame list right now, there's probably um, a couple names that you wouldn't recognize. And if that's the case, and if you're like me and you see those names, You'll look them up. Uh, you'll check out their stats. You'll look at their accomplishments, their story, everything that qualifies them to be in the Hall of Fame. When I was about 11 years old, I did this when I heard about a basketball player named Bill Russell. I never heard of him. Couldn't even tell you what team he played for. But I looked him up and all of his career accomplishments, everything that he did, everything that he put on his resume to put him in the Hall of Fame. He had five MVPs, 12 all-star appearances, and 11 championships. I thought six was a lot for Michael Jordan, but then I heard about Bill Russell with 11. You don't even have enough fingers to put that many rings on. But back to my point, you'd be amazed what you can learn about a character in the Bible when you look past their name and you look into their story. And we're going to do that again once, we're going to do that once again tonight. We've been doing that, and we're going to do it again tonight. I want to look at a character this evening who often gets a bad rap. There's good in this person's story that frequently gets overlooked by a certain tragedy that happens to him or happens because of him. It's someone who actually propelled Israel into victory many times. He advanced the armies of the Lord and people further into the land of the Lord. Uh, but when his name is brought up, everyone who knows the story, automatically thinks and points to this one big blunder of his. We will talk about that instance, but I'd like to look at the whole scope of the story and the character and not just that one isolated part. 
So tonight, our character in discussion is a man by the name of Jephthah. If you allow me, I want to look at Jephthah in three different parts this evening. His background, his story, and some takeaways from his life. Jephthah's story is told in the Bible in the book of Judges, chapters 10 through 12, but the climax really happens in chapters 11, and that's where we'll focus on mostly tonight. So just to give you some background and to put you in the scene a little bit, we are looking at a time of conquest and fighting over the land of Canaan. It's the land that God promised to the Israelites, but through many military failures and acts of disobedience by God's people, let's just say it's taken a lot longer to claim this land than it should have. The Israelites were commanded by God to drive out the wickedness of the land, but instead they cohabitated with it. There was no king of the land or the people, but along came these judges, and God spoke through them. He spoke to them, and he helped the judges lead the people. He helped the judges um, direct the people on the next move or at least tried to. The time of the judges is divided up into six periods, and Jephthah comes along in the fifth period. In Judges chapter 10, previous to Jephthah's appearance, before Jephthah comes on the scene, the Israelites are getting beat down. They are getting whooped uh, for years and years by the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Amorites. Everybody is getting their licks in on the Israelites. They are getting destroyed and losing any footing they have on the land of Canaan, the land that they were promised. And God says to them repeatedly, this is happening because you serve and worship other gods. So what happens? Well, the Israelites, they put away their other gods, their idols. They say, okay, we'll be good. We worship you. You're our only God. And they devote themselves to God for a while. And then what happens? They start doing their own thing again. And then they start getting whooped by their enemies. And then they call out to God, please save us. And God's like, okay, we'll do this again. And it's this constant cycle of obedience and disobedience by the people of Israel. And this happens long before Jephthah and happens long after Jephthah. So we get to a part in our background right before Jephthah enters the scene. The Ammonites are getting ready and are camped out in Gilead. The Ammonites are getting ready to attack and claim more of this land, while the Israelites have assembled and camped out in Mizpah, and they're really not sure what to do. The two camps are literally right next to each other uh, within a few miles. The leaders of Gilead say to themselves, whoever leads us in attacking the Ammonites out of our land, we will make them ruler over all who live in Gilead. In other words, they're saying, we need a hero. We need somebody who can lead us. We need a hero. Well, Jephthah is that hero tonight. And he comes on the scene in Judges 11, Judges chapter 11. Now, this is a lot of reading for us tonight, so I'm going to do my best to summarize, um, to help us out. I'm going to do my best to simplify it and explain the story, but I encourage you to go back and read it again this week uh, in Judges chapter 11. The Bible describes Jephthah as a mighty warrior, His father was Gilead, and his mother was a prostitute. Already some important details there for you. Gilead Gilead had other sons who didn't like Jephthah, simply for the mere fact that he was illegitimate. He was their half-brother. They didn't like him. They didn't want anything to do with him, so they drove him out of town. It says in verse 3 that Jephthah went to the land of Tob, and he developed his own following there of scoundrels. How would you like to be known as the leader of scoundrels? It's pretty intense. The leaders of Gilead came to Jephthah uh, when the Ammonites came into the land. And they said to him, come and be our commander. Fight the Ammonites for us and with us. And Jephthah's like, wait a second. Didn't you hate me? Drive me out of my house. Drive me out of the land. Drive me out of town. Why do you come to me now in your time of trouble? In other words, Jephthah's like, oh, so you need something from me now and then you come running to me. And their response to him is, yeah, well, nevertheless, put all that aside. If you lead us in victory, we will make you the ruler over all of us. And Jephthah, again, is like, are you serious? You're going to make me the ruler? And they say, yes, God is our witness. We will. So 
he agrees. Jephthah agrees to be their leader and fight the Ammonites. And he follows them and they go back to Mizpah where all the other Israelites are. And Jephthah repeats all of these words to him. He repeats all these words to him. His first step of action then is to send messengers to the Ammonite king asking this question. What do you have against me that you attacked my country? In other words, what did I ever do to you? What did I ever do to you? What did we ever do to you? And the king replies swiftly with this message saying, well, you took our land and we want it back. You took our land, we want it back. Pretty simple. But Jephthah, being very wise and articulate with his words, he sends a message back with a three-part rebuttal to the king's claim. He has an argument in three parts here. He says back to the king, number one, Gilead was never the king's land. It was never your land because Israel took it from the Amorites, not the Ammonites. You're getting your ites mixed up, dude. Number two, Israel should possess land given by their God and you should possess land given by your God, Ammon's God. And number three, nobody contested Israel's ownership of the land since its original conquest 300 years earlier. So basically he's saying, number one, we didn't steal the land from y'all. We stole it from somebody else. Joke's on you. Number two, um, Israel was promised this land by their God. Your God didn't promise you this land. So, sorry. And number three, no one said anything about this land before for 300 years since they captured it the first time. So why do you care now? Why are you making this a big deal now? And Jephthah puts this whole argument together, this whole disposition together, trying to be reasonable But it says that the king paid no attention whatsoever to his message and continued to wage war on the land there in Canaan. In verse 29, it says that the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and he crossed Gilead and Manasseh, then through Mizpah of Gilead. And then from there, he advanced against the Ammonites. I want to pause right here in our story because right until this point, everything is going pretty well. Everything's pretty good. No major issues, no hiccups in our story. But this next part is where everything gets a little bit tricky, especially for Jephthah. And for many people, this ruins his story and his fame just a little bit. So right before Jephthah attacks the Ammonites, he makes this vow to the Lord. He makes this promise to the Lord. In the heat of the moment, with the slip of his tongue, he says, God, if you give me my enemies into my hands, if you deliver the Amorites into my hands, I'm sorry, the Ammonites into my hands, getting my eyes mixed up, if you give my enemy into my hands, the first thing that comes out of my house when I return home in victory, I will offer you as a sacrifice. I will offer you as an offering. Just a very flippant and crazy thing to say um, because number one, you don't really know what's going to come out of your house. It could be a goat, it could be a dog, it could be the plumber, it could be grandma. You don't know, okay? So just a very interesting vow to make. And we'll find out what happens soon after, okay? So he charges the Amorites, I'm sorry, the Ammonites. He charges the Ammonites, he defeats them, and God gives them into his hands. He returns home, and who's there to greet him? Who's the first person to walk out of his house? He didn't even know it would be a person. But who's the first person to walk out of his house? His own daughter. His only daughter. His only child. First thing that walks out of the door of his house. She's dancing. She's got flowers in her hair. And uh, when Jephthah sees her and he realizes what's happened, when he realizes the promise that he made to God, he collapses and he tears his clothes and and he cries out. You know, what have I done? And verse 35, he's explaining to his daughter what the promise that he made. And he says, I made a vow that I cannot break. And surprisingly, his daughter says, Father, it's okay. It's all right. Really? Okay. She says, Father, it's okay. You made a vow that you cannot break and you must keep it. Sacrifice me as you have promised, but first let me go with my friends into the hills for two months and weep because I will never marry. That's probably the weirdest spring break that ever happened. But also, 
I think I would go into the hills and weep, not for the mere fact that I couldn't marry, but because I was going to be burned alive. I think I'd be thinking more about that, but that's just me. So Jephthah agrees, and she goes off for two months to mourn with her friends. She comes back and is sacrificed to the Lord, just as Jephthah has promised. And we'll talk more about that here in a second. But to wrap up Jephthah's story in Judges chapter 12, it goes on to tell the story of Jephthah and his disagreement with the people of Ephraim. They get mad because Gilead had defeated the Ammonites without them. They say, hey, we didn't get the memo. We, we didn't get to come to the party. And they felt cheated. And there's this bickering that goes on. Uh, there's fighting that intention that builds up. And the... Uh, Gileadites end up winning with Jephthah's help. And Jephthah went on leading Gilead and capturing the banks of the Jordan River as well, which is also very important. And all in all, he led the people of Israel six years in his life. Six years. You say, wow, that's not a long time. Well, it's longer than a lot of people who got to lead during that time. So real quick, um, it's quite the interesting story we have here with Jephthah tonight. It's a lot to unpack, uh, but I want to give you some characteristics of Jephthah and some takeaways from his story and maybe how they could apply to us. First, we know that he's a warrior. He's a skilled fighter in some ways. He's also born into a prosperous family, but because of his illegitimacy, he's outcasted by his brothers. We know that by the following that he builds in the land of Tob, those scoundrels that he actually leads, that lets us know that he knows how to gather the people. He knows how to speak to people. He communicated well. And when he comes back to Mizpah, after the leaders of Gilead come to him and say, hey, we need you, and he's like, okay. He comes back and he's like, hey, this is what they told me. This is what I told them. Just want to let you all know. He's communicating uh, kind of the situation that's at hand. He reiterates the cause of the conflict and what's about to happen. He's always wanting to make sure that people are connected to the situation and make them feel uh, informed. And along with being a great communicator, Jephthah is an excellent negotiator. Jephthah's preferred method of fighting was actually through the tongue rather than the sword. He wanted to settle issues by talking. He wanted to settle issues verbally. And his first move against the Ammonites was not through the sword, was not through fighting. It was through talking. It was through talking. Now, he didn't get anywhere with the king, but we can't say that he didn't try. He was very good with his words. He was very good with his tongue. But his tongue is also what gets him in trouble here in this story. He makes a rash and foolish vow that costs him greatly. It costs him greatly. Now, one characteristic admirable in this, even though he said a, a dumb vow, a stupid vow, he stuck to his word. Even though it pained him, even though it brought a huge consequence on his life, Jephthah was a man of his word. He was trustworthy and he was honorable. It says he was also controlled by God's spirit. That doesn't mean he was a puppet or a marionette, but God spoke to him. He worked through him. Um, he had a lot of brilliant military strategies, but a lot of that comes from the wisdom that God bestowed upon him. So if we had to sum up Jephthah's story tonight in one sentence, I guess you could put it like this. Like if uh, you were going to watch a movie about Jephthah and someone said, what's that about? This is what you would tell him. An outcast, yet great communicator and leader, captures the holy land for the Israelites, but makes a foolish expensive promise in the process. To wrap up this story tonight, I want to apply it to our lives as well. And I think there are many takeaways from Jephthah's story, but there are four key ones I want to focus on tonight. Number one, your background doesn't prevent God from working powerfully in your life. Your background does not prevent God from working powerfully in your life. Think about Jephthah and his upbringing. He's born from a prostitute, his family disowns him, and he becomes an outcast. Yet God still had plans for him. 
God had things he wanted to do in his life. God wanted to use him to lead Israel in taking back the land that they were promised. That's one of my favorite things about the Bible, how God uses unlikely people to accomplish his purpose and his plan. Have you ever disqualified yourself because of your background or your upbringing or your history or your past? Maybe your family line is just littered with heartbreak and pain. Maybe you grew up with nothing or you still feel like you have nothing. Maybe something happened to you and kicked you down and kept you down. Or maybe you made your own bad choices at some point in your life and they put you in a hole. I want to encourage you tonight, don't forget where you came from, but know this. Where you come from is nothing compared to where God wants to take you. Where you come from is nothing compared to where God wants to take you. Remember the origins of Jephthah's story and where God took him. Think of the countless others in the Bible who came from unlikely situations. No matter what your background, don't disqualify yourself because it doesn't prevent God from working powerfully in your life. Number two, if you are suffering from rejection, remember God's acceptance and consider his plan. If you are suffering from rejection, remember God's acceptance and consider his plan. Jephthah had to have suffered from rejection. His own family outcasted him. His own brothers pushed him away. The land he was in didn't even want him. He was left to lead a group of scoundrels. But the leaders of Gilead approached him, remember, and he could have chosen to stay hurt. He could have chosen to stay bitter. Remember when he asked me, you know, y'all, y'all pushed me away to begin with. Why do you want me now? He could have stayed in that mindset and said, nah, I'm not going to help you. But instead, he remembers God's acceptance, even though he was rejected by people. He remembers God's acceptance, and he considers his plan. He had every reason to stay in Tob. After all, he built quite a following, and he found people that had accepted, accepted him and listened to him and followed him. Why would he go back to people who pushed him away? You know, in our, in our own lives, it's so easy to wallow in our own self-pity. It's easy for us to sit in rejection and stay bitter. But when we're rejected by man and we stop and consider God's plan and how he's accepted us, that's when we're able to get up. That's when we're able to move forward. When we stop thinking about all the people and all the things that rejected us in our life and we, rem- we remember that God has accepted us and we consider the plan he still has for our lives, that the story is not over yet, that's when we're able to get up and that's when we're able to move forward. You know, I remember as a sophomore in college at Evangel, uh, there was a couple leadership positions and extracurriculars I wanted to audition and interview for. And in my mind, I don't know if I was just being cocky or arrogant or overconfident, Uh, I thought they were all lock for me. I thought I was going to get all of them. But I didn't just get denied by one. I got denied by every single one of them. I got rejected by all three of them that I was trying out for. And so it would have been really easy for me to stay down. But instead, I ended up getting two other positions that year that I never even considered. I was the copy editor for our yearbook, and I was my dorm floor's discipleship leader, I didn't even ask about these positions, but people approached me and ended up contacting me about them. The yearbook I ended up write won a bunch of first place awards nationally. And as a discipleship leader, I ended up getting a lot of experience and and growth as a leader and connecting with a lot of the guys that I lived with on my dorm floor. But I may have never had the opportunity to do those things if I got all the other positions that I wanted. All of that to say this, don't stay down from a rejection. Remember, God has accepted you and walked towards his plan. Your plans are not always God's plans. You may think that the plan fell through, but God might have a better one in store for you. Number three, the measure of your credibility comes through your willingness to take responsibility, even if it means you pay a price. Let me say that again. The measure of your credibility comes through your willingness to take responsibility 
even if it means you pay a price. Jephthah's vow put him in a very tough spot. And he could have easily said no in following through with it. He could have asked God to change his fate. He could have sacrificed something other than his daughter. But it was the principle that he stood by. He was a man of his word. And for him to go against his word might have actually been worse in the eyes of the people than for him to lose his daughter. Sometimes it's hard for us to take responsibility when we consider the consequences that we're facing. We try to hide it or we try to run away from it, but we have to be willing to follow through with our word and to take responsibility, even if it pains us. That's how we establish credibility. That's how we establish trustworthiness, honor, integrity. That's one thing I admire so much about my dad. Um, I don't think he's ever lied, at least to my knowledge. One time he was pulled over by a cop um, and the cop just gave him a warning for speeding, but as they were leaving, the cop noticed that my dad's seatbelt was unbuckled. And the cop asked him, sir, was your seatbelt unbuckled before I pulled you over or did you just unbuckle now? And he said, no, sir, uh, it's been unbuckled the whole time. And the cop, trying to give him an opportunity to get out of the citation, he said, sir, no, I don't think you understand. Was it unbuckled before or did you just unbuckle it? And my dad smiled and he said, you know, I understand what you're trying to do, but no, sir, it was unbuckled the entire time. And he got a ticket for it. My dad paid the price, but he took responsibility and maintained his credibility in the process. He knew what the consequences were going to be, but the integrity that he had meant more to him. The measure of our trustworthiness comes through our willingness to take responsibility, even if it means we pay a price. Last one for you tonight as we wrap up. I don't want to keep you any longer. Number four, God doesn't ask for our promises. He wants our obedience. God doesn't ask for our promises. He wants our obedience. You know, scholars argue over Jephthah's intentions when he made the vow to God. And if the sacrifice actually happened or not, some believe he actually knew that it would be human sacrifice, but in his culture, he thought it would be acceptable. Others think that he was just ignorant to God's laws and the commandment against human sacrifice and made a mistake. Some think that his daughter was never actually killed, but rather just set apart from God and not allowed to marry. Scripture does not actually explicitly state whether she was sacrificed as a burnt offering or not, so it's hard for us to infer either way. But whether it happened or not, or how it happened, I don't think it's relevant to the fact that Jephthah kept his vow. No matter how it happened, no matter what kind of sacrifice it was, Jephthah kept his vow, and he did what he said. However, based upon my study and other commentaries that I've read, there was actually no reason whatsoever for Jephthah to make the vow in the first place. He didn't have to make this promise. No one asked him to make an oath. He brought this out on his own will. God didn't say, hey, I need you to make me a promise. Hey, I need you to make me a vow. No, Jephthah is the one that brought this on himself. Maybe in his mind, he thought he would barter with God and get some brownie points towards victory. But here's the thing. God was on his side either way. God was with him. Remember, it says the Spirit of the Lord already came upon him. He didn't have to make a promise. He just needed to be obedient. Have you ever made a promise to God trying to cut a deal or get something that you wanted? I remember saying to God, if you give me a bike for Christmas, I'll never be mean to my sister ever again. And that's funny, and it's childish to think about that now. But even today, we are still trying to bargain with God all the time. See, God's faithfulness is not based upon empty vows or promises that you and I make. It's almost always dependent on God's goodness and a little bit of our obedience. We just have to be obedient. See, I believe that the Lord would have been with Jephthah on his side in battle, whether he made that vow or not. All Jephthah needed to do was be obedient and continue to be led by God's Spirit. We don't have to make promises. We don't have to make oaths or vows. We don't have to barter with God. 
God is not a businessman. We just need to be obedient. We just need to be led by his spirit. Like Jephthah, the spirit of God was upon him. I think the spirit of God is upon a lot of us, but yet we're still trying to cut a deal. Just be led by his spirit. Be obedient. God doesn't ask for our promises. He asks for our obedience. I hope that speaks to you tonight, and I hope you are strengthened by Jephthah's story, because I know I was reading through this and studying for this. So I encourage you, go back and read Judges chapter 10 through 12 this week. Read about Jephthah. Maybe you pick up, maybe you pick up on something that I missed. Thank you for spending your evening with us. We really appreciate it. Let me pray for you real quick as we close. God, I thank you for this evening. God, I thank you for opening your word to us and letting us see what you have to speak into our lives. God, there's so much from this story we can take away and learn. Lord, let us trust in you and be obedient in you. Despite our background, despite our shortcomings and our failures, despite rejection, let us be people of our word and be men and women of integrity. But more than that, let us be careful when we speak and communicate. God, help us to keep reading your word and to seek your truth. God, I pray if there's anyone watching this right now, Lord, you would just speak to them. You would reveal themselves to them. God, those who feel downtrodden, those who feel alone, those who feel that they're without purpose, Lord, would you reveal yourself to them and speak to them through your word and your Holy Spirit. Continue to keep us safe and in good spirit. We love you so much, God. We thank you. It's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, church. We hope you have a great night. And we can't wait to see you Sunday. Have a good week.